too much last night. Uh, okay. <laughs> a good party last night, I can tell you. Really? And we weren't invited? What's up with that? <laughs> well, what about you? Did you have a good weekend here so far? Yeah, we went, they took us out to Burns Steakhouse last night, which is like very expensive. I, I, you know, I'm going home with no money and all that stuff. But uh, no, it was like uh, the most uh, amazing. They gave us a tour of the wine cellar. They got like 100,000 bottles of wine there. And it's like just in the building. And the most amazing restaurant I think I've ever been to. It looked like a brothel, actually, because it was like red and little gold angels up the stairs and everything like that. Beautiful, beautiful. But yeah, I don't have to eat for three more days. That's what like, Maurice was just saying, too, during the last panel. Everyone's really talking about this place. Well, he was the one that knew of this place. So I, I credit him with uh, getting us there last night. And he said, you got to go to this place. And uh, it was, y'all got a great restaurant. You can't go too often or you'll have to remortgage your house. But uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's the best steak I've ever had in my life. That's awesome. It was good stuff, good stuff. Man, I'm so jealous. I'm so hungry though. It's okay, I had con pizza, so I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, besides that, obviously you are the voice of Goofy. Oh, really? Why in the way I'm so Okay, so just friend to friend, I want to know what goes making a good, I can't do an impression, I'm terrible. Yeah. Well, what goes into saying, like, gosh, so well? I can't even say it, I'm terrible. Well, uh, different characters require different things in your voice. Um, all voices, and I teach this, I teach students, you know, via Skype and all of that. There's three things to do in a voice. There is the tone, and that is what your throat does. That's like, is it a high voice like Mickey? Is it a deep voice like a little gravelly voice like that? And then there's the articulation. That's what your tongue and lips do. That is like, I could take this voice, for example, and talk. Or I could make him uh, articulate different and put on an accent and make him kind of Western guy. Or it could be some sort of an English person and uh, add that kind of articulation to the same tone and you get a new voice. The third part is the situation. In other words, what's he doing? Why is he doing it? The emotional life of the character. If uh, if I'm doing Goofy, and to do Goofy, you gotta kind of kind of almost swallow your tongue. It's like a gorge. You know, it's in the back of your throat. There, it's a very guttural kind of voice. And uh, then if I'm, uh, you know, then the articulation. He's got his dialect, and then the situation would be if I'm talking to Mickey, and I go, gorge, Mickey, let's get out of here. Uh, if I'm just sitting around eating a sandwich, that might work. If the house is on fire, I might say it a little differently. Let's get out of here! You know, something like that. Situation determines, and probably is the most important part of the voice, it's the emotional life of the character. What are they doing and why are they doing it? And that's how you come up with a voice. Thank you. It's good. Thank you. Like when I was researching you, and I love ask, uh, asking this to voice actors, is when you go through a drive-through. If you ever get to do one of your voices. Oh, I've done that yeah, when I was a kid, and I was learning that, and I'd get uh, old enough to drive. Like when I was 16, and, and we would go through Burger King or something like that. My friends would put me up to that. They'd do, do a weird voice, because they knew I did impressions. And I'd, I like a Whopper with cheese and a little pig with a line of Coke. You know, and they look out and stuff like that. That's cool, man. You know, and so that was kind of how it started, is just doing jokes around that or, or uh, you know, trying to impersonate my teachers, that kind of thing, getting in trouble a lot. So growing up, would you find that you invented most of your voices or were a lot of them based on impressions? Oh, yeah. I used to watch TV all the time, like Ed Sullivan, and they'd, uh, you know, you'd, I just try and pick up voices and, you know, Ed Sullivan had that, well, now on our show, there are these dancing bears and these vehicles. We are, you know, and they always have comedians like George Bush, who was a 1950s comedian man, and uh, he always had a cigar. And he was on TV, and Jack Benny, who was a great comedian of the 50s and 60s. And so I would just kind of start doing those. And any TV show that I found a voice that was fun to impersonate, I'd even see those, you know, uh, Billy Graham crusade, and I'd go to my mom, Mother, I hope we're having those mashed potatoes that I love so dearly. You know, and she's like, I'm going to win. And uh, 
my dad didn't know what to think of him. There's something wrong with him. You know. uh, really didn't know what to do. But I was just always enamored of movies and television and cartoons and uh, just found that I had a little propensity for picking up voices and it, it just kind of started from there, but I never thought it would be a career. And I was also reading about one of your mentors who's from Hanna-Barbera, uh, Dawes Butler. Dawes Butler, if you don't, how many of you know who Dawes Butler was? Okay, you got if you ever saw Yogi Bear, Captain Crunch, Elroy Jetson, uh, about 40-some Hanna-Barbera uh, and other uh, cartoon characters, major cartoon characters, he was probably the unknown Mel Blanc. He just was an incredibly versatile guy, and he used to have classes when I moved to Hollywood. Uh, they said, oh, you ought to take classes from Dawes Butler. I knew who he was. I, the Dawes Butler? And yeah, and I called him up, and he kind of had a voice, almost like Captain Crunch. His regular voice was almost like that. And, oh, Bill, come on over. And I'd go over to his house, and he would have classes on Wednesday. And people like Corey Burton were in the class, Nancy Cartwright. They, Nancy especially uh, would probably, you know, give her success, her credit uh, to him for getting her started in voiceover. Mine too, because he was the first one that really said, you're an actor first. It's not voice acting, it's, uh, it's not voice acting, it's voice acting. The acting is the important part that you are an actor that is portraying a character that has a wacky voice. You aren't just doing voices. And people come to me all the time and say, I want to get into voiceover. People say, I have a great voice. And I say, well, that's kind of like saying, I got a great guitar, I should be a guitarist. No, it's you learn that your voice is your instrument, you gotta learn how to handle it and how to, how to use it in different situations. That's the, the secret that most people don't know. It's awesome, I like hearing from that perspective. Uh, so we do have a microphone set up, and uh, yes. Bill is open to uh, whatever questions you may have. Answer have. anything that you want to hear about voiceover or Disney or anything else. Uh, first of all, you're very cool, so many <laughs> things. She is cool, um, huh? Yeah, childhood was like, what? <laughs> um, so Goofy's obviously such an iconic uh, character, one of Walt's original you know, uh, creations. How, when you took over, how much of, uh, of it did you say, I need to sort of uh, do what others have done before me, and how much do I make it my own? It's interesting, with Goofy, that came off of an audition. That was my first uh, animated character audition after moving to Hollywood. Uh, I was there were about four, four months. I moved out there in late 1986 on the advice of an agent I had in Dallas, which is where, where I was a stand-up comic and impressions. And they said, yeah, well, all the voices, you ought to go to Hollywood. So I went up to Hollywood. And um, when I got the audition, they said, do you do any of the Disney characters? My agent said that, because uh, they were looking at the time. And I said, well, I can kind of do a Goofy and a Mickey, and you know, if you can get that falsetto, gosh, oh boy, you can kind of get in the Mickey realm. And uh, or should I just, uh, hey, Goofy was my favorite ever since I was a kid. And so, I got a cassette of the original voice, Pinto Colby, studied that over just one weekend, went into my agent, did the copy that they had, and about a month later they called me up and I started doing it. Uh, doing it. And it's like, you know, every month or so I get to do a job and then it got more frequent. But the first year I was really doing an impression of Pinto Colby, trying to do his version of it. After a while, I found out I actually had to do a thing for Disneyland called State Fair, and I had to do the monorail spiel. We're now traveling 30 miles an hour over the parking lot. But as Goofy, we're now traveling 30 miles an hour over the parking lot. But that was not written for Goofy. It wasn't in his dialogue, in his vernacular. So I didn't know how to do it. How would Goofy say these words that Goofy normally wouldn't say? That was the hard part. And it wasn't until I kind of learned how the character thought that it became easy for me to take any sentence and make it sound like Goofy really said that. Uh, so I added some more of my, my own stuff to Goofy, and I used a lot from what was there as kind of a template before, but I've been able to modify it over the years. And also with uh, uh, the direction uh, that I get, sometimes uh, the original, uh, Goofy Pinto Colby, he had a, he did a very almost mumbling, very 
far in the back of the throat. When I started having, uh, this first series I did was called Goof Troop, and when I did that, then they said, okay, you gotta articulate more for the kids. So I would do the same song, oh, the world holds me, oh, the world. I brought it a little bit up more toward the front of the uh, voice, so it's a little more articulate. And when you're doing something for like Disney on ice, I even have to slow it down a little bit because there's a lot of reverb in, in an auditorium like that. And they can't understand what I'm saying, so I have to kind of do it. Gorge me, how are you doing? And kind of over articulate so that people in the audience can hear what I say. So it depends on what the uh, project is. And then when we did a goofy movie, I had to add a lot of uh, nuances and emotions that he never had before. Before that, he was kind of like a silly character and just, eh, it wasn't that, you know, didn't have pathos or anything like that. But in the movie, we had to worry about, well, Max is going to go, you know, get in trouble and go to jail and all that kind of stuff. And so we had to have the kind of tender, loving father as well as the regular goof. And that, uh, that took a while to, to accomplish, but uh, we were able to add those and still keep goofy. Thank you. What's your name? Spacey. Hello, dude. Hey. Um, I just start, I'll start with a comment. Uh, my wife and I actually just watched a Goofy movie uh, together. And it's, it's weird. Uh, it made me cry watching it because now with that distance, you can see the father-son relationship. And I feel like you did a great job of conveying that. Thanks. I appreciate that. That movie has like come back. Um, a few weeks ago, I was on the Disney cruise ship performing, doing a live show. And at the same time, this is how they schedule stuff, they were having a showing, uh, for a whole week, they showed a goofy movie at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. And they'd asked me, oh, we want you there for this. And I said, I'm on the Disney cruise ship. I can't be there. Why couldn't they put it the next week or something? But anyway, I filmed a little intro for the movie. But as I understand it, people were like, it was like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. People were like, uh, singing along, singing eye to eye and everything, and shouting out. So it's amazing what the people, uh, it's kind of become a little cult classic in a way. So I, I really appreciate that. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a very heartwarming that uh, people care that much about this. And it, a lot of people come up to me and say, yeah, me and my dad couldn't talk together until we saw that movie. And uh, it is kind of heartwarming. When I saw an early screening of it on the Disney lot, and I was really sweating because I, I was sitting here and it wasn't done totally animated. And my family was here, but like, like right up here was Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg. And I'm sweating it. Oh, I hope they like this, you know. And after the movie, he did say, Hello, Bill. I'm Michael Eisner. And it's wonderful. You know. And uh, but coming out of the theater, my son, who was about five years old at the time, was crying. And I said, what's the matter, buddy? Didn't you like the movie? He said, well, when Goofy went over the waterfall, I thought that was you. <laughs> oh, yes. So I knew the movie had heart, but I appreciate that. Thanks. And my question, um, this is something my wife asked because she is a director, actually. And her question is always, uh, what's the best piece of direction you've gotten um, that's stuck with you? It's to, uh, the best piece of direction I could give is when you're in the booth, when you are performing, you've got to get out of your skin. In other words, you can't worry about what they're thinking about you and to inhabit the character. You've got to kind of get over the shyness. Oh, I hope I'm feeling good, you know, and that. And they're always behind the glass and you can't hear them and you've got the microphone on. What are you doing? You know, and they're like, going like, I'm thinking they're saying, this guy sucks, can we get someone else? And they're probably saying, no, I wanted mayonnaise on the sandwich. And, you know, so you never know, you, but you just have to put that out of your mind. So it's inhabit the character, and which is kind of difficult in voiceover because there's no one to play against. Generally, we do the dialogue alone. I don't do it with the other actors, at least on the Disney shows. Um, I guess it's easier for the engineers. So, I just have a script, but I know how, the way Mindy would say lines, and the way that Donald would say lines, and so all I gotta know is, how far away is he? And what's the situation? Again, is the house on fire? Is it in a race? Is it just talking to him? Is he like here, 10 feet away, or 50 feet away? So I don't know. Why, Mindy? Why, Mindy? Why, Mindy? 
So I know how to project it. And in your mind, you have to kind of create the scene because all you got is a microphone and a piece of paper. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Alina. So I was wondering, so you've done a lot of work with the Goofy, and I was just wondering, what was your favorite scene to ever record or do, or what was the one with your favorite end result? Like, through memories or just the result itself? Gosh, well, I did uh, probably one of the early ones. Well, there's so many over the years. When I first started Goof Troop, that was great because we had such a great cast. And here I was the title character with all of these guys that had been around longer than me. Jim Cummings and April Winchell and Frank Welker and Rob Paulson and, I mean, you know, Nancy Cartwright was in the show, but pre Bart Simpson, and about the same time, I guess. And uh, so, you know, these guys, they knew what they were doing, and I had to kind of carry the show as the lead character. Frightened me, but it was great training, and so it was like trial by fire. Then, of course, yeah, the Goofy movie, because, or actually, uh, Prince and the Pauper was the first time I ever saw one of our projects on the big screen in the theater. And that was really cool to kind of see Goofy and to hear him with my voice in front of an audience and see how they reacted to it. That was really a high point uh, of the, my early career. And, but the most fun is actually meeting the fans because actually doing a, a, set, a session can be kind of boring. It's like, okay, we're gonna take line three. Hey, Mick, what's, uh, what's up? Hey, Mick, what's up? Hey, Mick, what's up? Okay, take three, print that. Let's go on to take uh, line 18, and we go, come on, let's get the topster and get out of here. Come on, we're gonna get the topster and get out of here. And do that over and over, and then listen to the dialogue uh, coach and say, okay, a little faster or a little slower or whatever. Um, that's pretty boring to watch, really. It's, uh, but when you get a chance to talk to fans and that they appreciate that, that's the coolest part. Thank you. Hi. Hello, how are you? Good. Um, I'm Sienna. Um, my question was, I understand that there were two goofy movies and I adore them both. And um, which one did you have more fun filming? I couldn't quite hear that. Yeah. Oh, the, the, uh, which of the two Goofy movies did I have more fun recording? The first one. And that's because, first of all, I got to sing in it. We didn't have any singing in the second one. And that's fun to do. Um, that also, it, it, it's kind of weird the way that, that that came about. That was originally said to be a Goof Troop movie. They had had a DuckTales movie after the series, then they had a Goof Troop movie, and we had all the characters from Goof Troop, and then Jeffrey Katzenberg wanted to turn it into a buddy-buddy kind of picture. So, we recorded the first kind of uh, script of it. No, nah, they didn't like that. We went back, we rewrote it, and we started doing it again. And then, over the course of actually about two years, I went back probably 30 to 40 times to record more stuff where they would kind of fine-tune it, that worked, that didn't work, and they would do it over and over until they got it just perfect. A, an extremely goofy movie was done just a couple, a few years later, and I only worked on it for like three or four days. So about 40 days to four days. So it was much quicker, we just, boom, knocked it out. And B.B. Uh, Newworth played Goofy's girlfriend, Sylvia, in uh, the uh, second movie. And one thing, you think, oh, we're in the studio together. No, she was in New York doing Broadway. I was in L.A. And I've never even talked to her on the phone. And yet we did this whole movie together, uh, talking back and forth. But she did her lines in New York. I did them in L.A. But the first one, uh, usually the first of a, a series, if there's a sequel, is always the most fun to do because it's original and it's fun. Thank you. You're welcome. Your voice. What's your name? Hi, I'm Lorraine. I guess people have already asked some of the questions I was thinking of. Um, I guess I could just ask, do you think if you would like cats? I don't know what to say. <laughs> or you, I don't know. Because <laughs> I wanted to ask if your, your, your favorite moment or something like that, but I just, I oh, don't like, well, I get a blank of what to ask now. <laughs> favorite moments, uh, you know, there's so, there's different ones. I also like uh, when I get step out from Goofy and do other characters. 
Uh, and people forget that I do Pluto, so oh. I can do that in any language. So uh, German, German Pluto. You know, there you go. Um, You're multilingual. I love it. Yeah. See, I'm multi. You know, barking. I guess. <laughs> um, pardon? Both characters regularly for Disney. Clearly. Oh, yeah, and uh, I've done a lot of others uh, over the years. Um, as a voice actor, you're, you're, your whole job is actually looking for work. So I've done a lot of more or less, more or less uncredited uh, things so in, like, in movies. Do you do other characters? Or, or oh, absolutely. Or? Goofy, Pluto, Horse, Horse Collar, uh, Practical Pig of the Three Little Pigs when they need that. Oh. The Seven Dwarfs and the Traditional Dwarfs, I do Sleepy's voice. In the series uh, 7D, I'm uh, I'm Doc, so I'm in that. In one of the Mickey Mouse short cartoons, they had one where they had the seven dwarfs, and I did the traditional Doc in that one. Uh, so you always get to lend your voice to a lot of unusual characters. The Sheriff of Nottingham, which was that Pat Butcher voice that I did there. Whenever they need that character, they use me, and. Um, um, a lot of background voices too. I do for Pixar and for Disney, and over the years I've done a, a lot of Disney movies going back as far as Beauty and the Beast. Wow. If, you, uh, if you see Beauty and the Beast when they're storming the castle, a lot of the crowd scene, that's me. We go into a studio with a bunch of actors, and then we're kind of watching the movie. When you do the original recording, it's just you and a script. But when they get it almost done, and oh, we need a crowd scene here. They get a bunch of actors in a, a big studio and we're watching the movie and okay, right here, we're storm the castle, kill the beast, that kind of thing. Um, I, sometimes you get to do sound effects in Beauty and the Beast, totally uncredited thing. It's the most obscure thing I've ever done. It's when uh, Gaston is singing about decorating with antlers and all of that in the bar. He throws three eggs up in the air and they go, that's me. <laughs> I'm eggs. I got eggs on my resume. Um, over the years, then, like, uh, oh my gosh, Toy Story. Uh, I was the mission control. Two minus twenty-seven, twenty-six, getting ready for launch. And you know, little little incidental voices here and there. Bugs Life. I was like a bug in the Bug City. I, I think I did a New York. Hey, hey, move over. You know that kind of thing. And and uh, you know, then there was, uh, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, uh, Pocahontas, we did. And even up into recently, uh, let's see, the lore, that's not Disney, but I've done a lot of non-Disney ones too. Most recently, Sing, which is for DreamWorks. I was a, well, oh, this three reporting dog. And uh, so I mean, another dog, I seem to have cornered the dog market. <laughs> Uh, Secret Life of Pets, probably another dog, a lot of things in there. We just did, uh, um, upcoming movie, The Grinch, which will be out around Christmas, and I think that's uh, the works will be coming out. I did some background voices in that. Monsters, Inc., some of the little yellow guys that are kind of getting the guy with a sock on his shoulder, you know. Get him, you know, take him down right now. You know, the little military voices. Um, oh my goodness, a lot of live action movies, but uh, probably, the, actually I can go into another question that someone may ask, what's the hardest thing I've had to do? That was actually a movie called Return of the Mask. They had a dog, Otis, who got the mask on and turned into this creature. And that was actually three of us. Frank Welker did that, uh, Richard Horowitz, and me were doing that dog. I did some of the lower registered stuff, Richard would do the higher, but that ripped the hell out of my throat because he gets his tongue like caught and he's like dragged over a chandelier and up a balcony and everything. So you're in the studio just just as loud as you can. You know, do that for about an hour and a half, but you come out. Oh, that was Bill. Thanks so much for your job. I'll tear your throat up. So you never know what you're gonna, you're gonna have to do. But uh, and a lot of, a lot of fun movies that uh, have to do. So there's a lot of incidental characters as well as the major ones. And for Warner Brothers, I've, you know, I've voiced actually. Probably more major characters for Warner Brothers over the years, but not as often. They're different than Disney in that they'll have different projects, will have different actors do the voices. Um, like in, in the, well, one for Warner Brothers with Bugs and Daffy, I did on Robot Chicken. They were having a, a, a 
wrap off with Elmer Fudd. Oh, brother, can I just take you? You're a You know, so I got to do that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, in Space Jam, I got to do Fuck oh, on a big chicken. And Fuck them, fuck a dash. They're monsters! You know, I got to say things like that. So, um, uh, very, very fortunate to fill some pretty big shoes from uh, Mel Blanc and a lot of incidental things on cartoons all over the place. Thank you. Austin. My question was, what was your work experience with Wallace Shawn? With Wally Shawn? Yes, sir. Uh, I only met him outside the, the studio when we were uh, working in there. He, of course, did the principal in, in a, a Goofy movie, you know. And I kind of have, you know, I don't know. Mr. Goof, you know, that kind of thing. Um, he's a nice guy, and uh, most actors are pretty kind of laid back when they're just waiting in the room. They're going over lines, and so uh, uh, they don't have that big energy uh, that you would associate with them until they get in. When I met Robin Williams, he, uh, off camera, he was just kind of into his thing and sitting there very nice, but he wasn't on. But when you get him, oh my goodness, you know, he's like big when he gets on stage and everything. There's two or more people around, he's on. But uh, uh, most of the time, it's just uh, like a few people sitting around talking. All right, and then the other question was, uh, you said you do Disney, but do you, besides Goofy, do you also do Disney attractions that have nothing to do with Goofy at all, or no? It's not quite that. Uh, sorry, this is my, is this better? Oh, have I have done any attractions that don't have anything to do with Goofy? Yes, sir. Well, uh, right now at Walt Disney World, there is, uh, they are uh, replacing the great movie ride at the, what was the Disney MGM studio, I guess it's the, the studios now. And uh, in the Wizard of Oz scene, I was Bert Lahr, I was the uh, Cowardly Lion, saying things like, I think that's a screw. <laughs> and that's basically all I had to do, but it ran for like 20 years. And we are replacing that with a new attraction based on the new Mickey shorts that we're doing right now. So you get to actually like be in a cartoon in this thing. So uh, we just recorded a few weeks ago, actually. And then I saw the um, video of the ride at D23. And oh. it's amazing how it's like a two and a half D. Because it's going to like open up and you're going to be on a drive uh, trackless vehicle and go through the attraction. Oh, that's, oh yeah, okay, you know more about it than I do. I didn't know if you were going to be in it, though. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, maybe it's this mic. Is this bad? It, the mic's a little wonky. It's uh, like, oh, it's okay. always echoey up here. Is the problem. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, you just talk directly into it. Like this? Better. Now, the other voice actor I also know is James Arnold Taylor. James is, yeah, he's a really nice guy. He's a great impressionist, and I've done panels with him where we're doing, and uh, it's kind of funny. We, we were doing uh, Christopher Lloyd we kind of together. He was doing, and I, I, my Christopher Lloyd is based on Taxi, Jim Ignatowski. Oh, okay, talk. Oh, okay, Alex. You know, that kind of thing. And he was doing it more based on Doc Brown from Back to the Future, which are very subtle differences. And I'd never heard the way that he was doing it, uh, which is a little higher in pitch and everything. It's kind of fun to do the same character. People will pick up on different parts of the voice and, and bring them to life. <coughs> no. oh, sorry. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. What's your name? Paul. Uh, my question is, uh, are you going to be in Kingdom Hearts 3? Like, uh, as a voice? Yeah, and I can tell you a little behind the scenes stuff that uh, basically the reason I haven't, uh, we haven't finished that is because there's a strike that was going on between Screen Actors Guild, and I'm a union member, and the producers because of a lot of, you know, uh, video games make like billions of dollars. They make more money than the, the movies or cartoons, all of that stuff put together, and yet the actors don't get any residuals. And so they can make a billion dollars, and the actor might get the session fee, but that's it. Well, they decided to go to strike, and the union said that there could be a strike over that. 
Well, they finally settled it just uh, just a few days ago, and I don't even know the details or what was settled and everything, but that allows us to go back to work on those video games that we couldn't for several months, and uh, so people have been waiting and stuff so that they can use union actors on those programs. And uh, so I'll be happy, so it should start up again one of these days. Yeah. Uh, People always ask me if, uh, you know, like, oh, when's it going to come out? I don't know. They don't tell me, you know. Bob I was not telling me, hey, Bill, we're going to release, uh, you know, Kingdom Hearts and whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious to see it, too. I haven't seen any of it. And I have one more question. Uh, how did you feel when you were first approached with the first Kingdom Hearts game, like, uh, uh, having a voice like a different thing. It's totally different. Unlike any other project that I've ever done, that was animated first in Japan. So in my headphones, I am hearing the Japanese Goofy. Now if you think about it, there's a, there's a division of Disney that goes around the world and finds all of these characters in about 43 different languages. And there's a Norwegian Goofy and a Chinese Goofy and a Taiwanese Goofy and a you know, Spanish goofy and a, uh, you know, How do we get for a panel? Can you imagine just a panel oh, of goofies? I got to go to lunch with the Norwegian and the Chinese goofy once. They wanted to meet me in Burbank. They called over, could we meet Bill? And I, so I went to lunch. It's so weird because Chinese is like, and the Norwegian is, you know, really strange. But the Japanese actor is really good. He, but in my headphones, I'm hearing the Japanese, and I have to replace that in the same amount of time with the English line. Go on, sort of a heartless, and you might be one time over to my, you know, something like that, and you have to do it over and over. And they brought the, the contingent from the game company over from Japan, and I actually got a a, a direction from one of the guys. I was doing Pluto, and I go. And he would go, oh, good to be, woof, woof, woof. Oh, that right, that's right. Uh, it was very strange. It was an unusual thing to do, uh, uh, you know, in, a, in another language and translate it back into English. And one time I had to do a, uh, a an entire series of cartoons when I first started. They had home video, had old goofy cartoons on a DVD or a CD, actually in those times a VHS. And they came to me and they said, Bill, you're going to have to do Goofy's voice in German for these three, uh, six cartoons. And I said, I don't speak German. What? I said, we'll get you a professor or something. You know, we'll get someone that can teach you how to do German. That's, we've got to do this tomorrow. Oh, we'll work on it. So I went to a session and she was, she was, Neat lady, but I don't think she ever seen a cartoon in her life. Because she is watching, we were watching some of the old cartoons that we were going to loop, and she is like, Why is Goofy falling up to see everything? He is not cute. What is he? <laughs> cartoon, don't worry. You know. And so I had to go word by word, syllable by syllable, doing, you know, and it's hard because German is kind of like Ludwig von Drake. It's up here in the front of the way there. You know, it's like up there in the lips. But the wars would go, boys. They couldn't find anybody in German Germany that could do that. So I had to go, boy, 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 you know, and all of this stuff. Two picture, trying to get it perfect, almost a syllable at a time. It was, I think, a 14-hour session that I had to do. Getting that, we got that thing done. And finally, and I asked about a month later, I said, whatever happened to the German thing? They said, well, it was pretty good, but you had a, an Austrian accent. <laughs> they didn't check that this professor of German was from Austria, so her accent is what I was picking up. And that wasn't right for Germany, I guess. So it's like doing a New York picture and doing a southern accent in it, like, you know. Instead of like that, you I what are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. Same you know, the same language but different dialect. So luckily now they have a, a contention that goes around and does nothing but finds all of the things, like they have a new movie, yeah, they got Frozen or something, they get all of those characters in 40-some languages, or Moana, or any of the things, they have to find all of those characters in this new movie in 40-some different languages. It's a big division. Good question. Yeah, that's good. What's your name? My name's Joe Sad. 
I um, don't have a question, I just have a statement for you. I've been a seasonal cast member at Disney for six years, and I've worked with you many times, as well as Pluto. And I just want you to know that I, I work DPI, so people come up and have their photograph, and they interact with you, and um, they hear you. I just want you to know that they hear your voice. They know that you're talking to them. Oh, good. They, they, they know Pluto, they know that exactly it's your voice, they hear you in their head, and you're with them. And it's a really cool thing to watch that interaction. Oh, it, it's so great. The fans are so great. Uh, once in a while, um, I don't do that out in public to confuse kids. Like, why is that weird guy yeah, talking like Goofy? But uh, once in a while, and I've done this before, like I'm in line at uh, Pirates of the Caribbean or something. Some guy's holding his little kid who's probably sleeping. Ah, I'm tired. We're gonna go on every ride. Hey, a lot of So, uh, so they're standing there, and I'll go and just kind of, oh, yeah, the gorge. And the kids like look around. Hey, you're goofy. Shut up. Don't like when you. And freaks them out, you know. Have so you ever I, just stood back and watched the characters? Ever stood back and just watched Pluto and Goofy in the parks? And just and watch. It's it's a lot of fun, and I will occasionally go up to the costume character. Um, and whisper to them, oh, I'm your voice. And they always go nuts, you know. Like, oh. And not once in 30 years has everyone ever broken character. No one has ever broken character and said, oh, that's so cool, or anything. They wave me backstage, and then I've been able to talk with them. But never out in the park. So that, that's a testament to the, the, the love that these people have for the characters. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's got to be a tough job because you, if you think about it, they're in those suits and they aren't that, that cool. And you're in a hundred degree heat doing a parade for about 30 minutes. And I've seen it when they go backstage and they, uh, and they're just about ready to die. So, you know, if you're over 30, it will kill you. They love what they do. They do love what they do. I'm, I'm pleased. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Because now the the basis, let's say, well, my uh, series the seventy had one of the best voice casts casts that I've ever had since Goof Troop. Because we had Maurice LaMarche, we had uh, you know uh, Kevin Michael Richardson, Billy West, Steve Stanton, uh, Scotty Mendel, uh, Lee Allen Baker, um, the cream of the crop in voice acting. Um, the first episode or two to kind of get everyone's character, we recorded ensemble. But I really miss working with the other actors. Uh, I don't do that anymore. It's easier with non-linear editing and Pro Tools for me to go in and let's say I have a line, hey, maybe, you know, and I do it four times. And I'll usually do a, a, a count of three. I'll usually do it, okay, let's do uh, takes A, B, and C. And I'll go, why, Mickey? Why, Mickey? Why, Mickey? And they'll pick me like number three. If they bring Brett Iwan, who's doing Mickey, and he comes in and, gosh, hi, Goofy, hi, Goofy, what's going on, Goofy? And they like take two. They'll take that take two, my take three, and edit them together, and you have the best performance from each of us. In the old days, we had to all do it together like a radio play, and you had to do it in one take, and we did it over and over until you got that perfect take. It's a lot easier for the engineers to put together a good show that way, because in the old days, we were recording on like 24 track recorders, and so uh, it was all on tape, and you couldn't really switch it around and, and edit it as easy. Uh, and I really miss, so but from that first time with the 7D, I haven't been able to record with anyone. And so I'll see Maurice or Billy or someone in the, in the lobby, you know. But it's also easier for us, if they're so busy with other projects, it's hard to get like eight people together in a studio at the same time. Uh, so it's easier that, oh, I can be there Wednesday at three, and Billy can be there Thursday at four, and they'll do it throughout the week, and it's much easier for scheduling too. So that's why they do it. 
but it's rougher on the actors and it's much more fun when you're actually acting with someone else than when you're doing it, you know, just in your own head and by yourself. It uh, takes some of the fun about it, uh, so it's more like we got to see these people socially now. But there's a lot of a lot of people. James Arnold Taylor was mentioned earlier. I, I've never done a show with him, but I know him, and we've done panels and things together. So that's about as close as I've, I've gotten. And, uh, uh, there's so many great, great uh, people in the early days. Like I say, with Goof Troop, I was sitting next to Frank Welker for 80 some episodes and listened to him, and you learn a lot from that. And I miss that a lot. I miss that working with those guys. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for your continued work, and I hope that you're able to do it as long as possible. Me too. <laughs> thank you. Okay, these are our final three questions. What's your name? Lucas. Uh, this is for I know you've been in the industry for a long time, and you've done a lot of different roles. Have there been any that you've regretted doing, or what you could have done a better job at, anything like that? In the things that I've done, do I look back and say, yeah, all the time. When I see something on TV, I'll go, why did they pick that take? You know, I'll, I'll think, oh, I think I could have done that better. But you always do that. You know, I always, auditions especially. I'll go to an audition, and I'll, on the way home, I'll, I'll do the lines again. I say, oh, I did them better now. I, I wish I'd done that at the audition, you know. So, yeah, you always, you always watch your stuff with a critical eye and think, hmm. I could have done that better, or, uh, and uh, sometimes you'll hear another character and you go, gosh, I wish they would have given me a chance to do that character. I think I could have done a better job. But it's so competitive in Hollywood. There's about 150,000 Screen Actors Guild members. These are the people that paid the two or $3,000 to join the union. They're that serious about acting. And on any given week, there's about 10,000 actual acting jobs. So on any given week, there's about 140,000 out-of-work actors. It's extremely competitive, and now that celebrities want to do animation all the time, uh, that takes away some of the plum roles that come out uh, for actors, and they say, yeah, we'll, we'll work with, uh, you know, oh gosh, Tom Hanks wants to do this cartoon. And uh, I don't think Tom needs the money, but he likes doing it, and so there, there you go. So uh, celebrities in general can take away a lot of work from a lot of uh, really good voice actors that have trouble finding enough work. And it's not like, um, I've been so fortunate with Goofy, here's one of the only characters in the world that is, along with maybe Mickey and Donald, uh, Minnie and uh, Pluto that had been you know, people always ask me, do I, would I have uh, rather been on camera? And I would say, how many people were on television in 1987 when I started that are still on TV about every day? There's hardly any. And these are the only characters. I mean, Mickey was the first talking character, and he's still popular after something that they're doing right. And I'm on three series right now in production, along with all of the other stuff for the parks and toys and talking watches and whatever they come up with. Um, so I really realized that, you know, Goofy and this, this character, is, and he was my favorite growing up, which makes it doubly fun, that I'm really lucky to have gotten that character. If I did a great Popeye voice, I'd be out of work. <laughs> they aren't doing anything with that character, but they still keep using these characters over and over. And uh, so I've been very fortunate to have uh, voice that, and I figured if that was the only one I ever did in my career, I would have been extremely fortunate. I'm fortunate that you're still doing it. Thank you, sir. God's with you. My pleasure. Hi, how are you? Can someone tilt the microphone on? Yes. Thank you, guys. Look at that. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Yeah. Thanks okay. for coming up. How are you doing? What's your Hi. name? I'm Talia, and um, I have a question, and it is... Is it hard doing the voice of Goofy when he's falling from the slope? With like a sore throat or something? When he's falling, yeah. oh, the falling, that could be tough. I always have to do that at least twice if it's a new engineer. If he knows me, he'll adjust the microphone volume correctly because it's really loud and you have to do it just as loud as you can to get it right. And it's usually like, uh, see if I can hit the right note. The hard part is to hit that first note and it's like, What's your question? 
him drinking heavily. No, it's, uh, <laughs> so much I, I sometimes I think I slip into it at, at home uh, and I think we're kind of I've done that voice so much it's like I'm becoming goofy and goofy is becoming me and yeah I, there's a goofy curse that comes with this thing um, I tell the story and it's absolutely true I was putting on my Christmas lights once and I was like oh, oh, you know, and sometimes I actually get a little oh, oh, you know. I was up on a ladder and I had my sweats on and everything. I stepped down off the ladder and I stepped back and my foot hit the riser on the lawn sprinkler system by the rose bushes. And so I started falling backwards. And now that'd be silly enough if I fell back into the rose bushes. But the goofy curse is that the first rose bush grabbed my pants and yanked them down. <laughs> and I fell bare butted into the second rose bush. And it was like the Three Stooges. My wife was like pulling thorns out of my butt. And I was like, bing, bing, ow, oh. I blame that on Goofy. So anything, I, now the only thing I haven't had a chance to do is if I ever get a speeding ticket, can I, you know, coerce all of a sudden, what do you expect? I'm Goofy, you know. I'm gonna give that a shot if it ever comes up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm very honored that they, they chose me to honor me in that way. And now they'll just send me a lot of cash. Maybe it should have come along with a million dollars or something. That would have been nice. So I'm hoping to win the Nobel Prize next. So. Of course. Well, we'll be rooting for you for that. And thank you so much again. You were so fantastic. Can we get another big round?